and good morning, afternoon or evening, whenever you are watching. You are welcome to be here and worship with us at Hamilton South and Quarter Churches. So let us worship God. Our call to worship. Gather today with the worldwide church, even if you feel alone. Withdraw with intention today to be with God. If you have any fear, bring it to Christ that he may help you walk as the individual that you are. Worship as you can. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Faithful God, we come into your presence, those of us who worship often and those who haven't for a time, those who are full of faith and those who don't know what to believe, those who can hardly keep from singing and those who can barely face the day. We come to worship you because you have called us, because you love us, because you are our God. We come not because we are good or pure or holy, but because of our need. We come knowing that again and again we have failed to live as you would have us live, that we have not loved one another, that we have not loved your creation, that we have not loved you, that we have not loved ourselves. Forgive us God and renew us to be your people. Make us one and reassure us in our true identity as children of the one who is above all things. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our faithful and forgiving friend, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through to 15. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart, that is, 
the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and that are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can we call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Amen. Our second reading is from Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through to 33. Immediately Jesus made the disciples go into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out the boat, walked onto the water and came towards Jesus. But when they saw the wind, he was afraid, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Amen.
I invite you to come for a walk today. John Ortberg, an inspirational Christian writer, notes that the Bible, amongst other things, is a list of walks. The first one was taken by God himself, who walked in the garden in the cool of the day. But as a general rule, God asked people to walk with him. There was a difficult walk that Abraham took with his son Isaac when he was asked to sacrifice his son. There was the walk of freedom from Egypt for the Israelites, led by Moses, and their amazing walk through the parted Red Sea. There was jo Joshua's triumphal walk around the walls of Jericho, the disciples' illuminating walk to Emmaus, the revelation to Paul on the road to Damascus, and there was the sad and difficult walk that Jesus took to Calvary. But perhaps Peter took the most astounding walk of all, the day he got out of the boat and walked on water. It's unforgettable because of what he was walking on and whom he was walking with. Let Peter's walk serve as an invitation to us to step out in faith and experience a greater encounter of the power and the presence of God. Let water walking be a picture of doing something with God's help that we couldn't do on our own. Ortberg notes that there is a consistent pattern in scripture of what happens in a life that God wants to use. There is always a call. God asks an ordinary person to engage in extraordinary trust, that of getting out of the boat. There is always fear. When we are called to do something, there is a fear of our own inadequacy, of failure, or even of God. But there is also reassurance. God promises he will always be with us. And there is always a decision. Some pipe, sometimes people say yes to God and some people say no. And finally, there is always a changed life. Those who follow God's calling don't walk the walk perfectly not by a long shot, but because they say yes to God, they learn and grow even from their failures. Those who say no are changed too. They become a little harder, more resistant to God's calling, a little more likely to say no the next time. Whatever the decision, it always changes a life and it changes the world that life touches. Ortberg tells the story of a balloon ride his wife had bought him for his birthday. It was a beautiful day. He and his wife and another couple were to go in this flight and they introduced themselves to one another and got into the basket. When getting into the basket, Ortberg was hit with fear. He had thought the basket sides would have been about chest high, but they only came up to his knees. He realised that one good lurch of the basket could throw someone over the side. So he held on with grim determination and white knuckles. His wife didn't like heights and he could see she was tenser than him. She didn't move throughout the flight and wouldn't look at anything he pointed out below. He decided that he would like to get to know the young man who was flying the balloon. It would relieve his fear somewhat if he was reassured of the credentials of their pilot. After all, he had placed their lives in his hands. Ortberg had hoped that the young man had had a responsible job that had required good qualifications. As soon as the young pilot began to answer, Dude, it's like this, he knew he was in trouble. The young man told of how he had been driving around in his pickup whilst drunk and crashed the truck, badly injuring his brother. His brother still couldn't move around too well but got pleasure from watching hot air balloons flying in the sky. After telling his story, the pilot turned to them all and said, by the way, if things get a little choppy on the way down, don't be surprised. I've never flown this particular balloon and I'm not too sure how it's going to handle the descent. At this point, Ortberg's wife turned to him and said, you mean to tell me we are a thousand feet up in the air with an unemployed surfer who started flying hot air balloons because he got drunk, crashed a pickup, injured his brother, and hasn't been in this one before and doesn't know how to bring it down. The great question for them was, 
can we trust the pilot? Our journey in life is a little bit like that balloon ride. It can be smooth at times, a bit choppy at other times. It can be scary and we wish the sides of the basket were a little higher. But the question is, can we trust the pilot? God has promised to be with us always through the good and bad times, through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. God is our pilot. But first, we need to recognise that first step, his call. He needs to get our attention because so often we fail to hear his call, just as the attention of Jesus' disciples was caught as he walked towards them on the water. I know it took me a while to recognise God's call for me to become a reader. For many years I had worked in children's ministry, both in my own congregation and within the presbytery. That was my calling and I believed that was what God would always want me to do. That was my boat in which I was happy and confident, just as Peter was an experienced fisherman and comfortable in a boat. I was comfortable and confident in my children's ministry. But God had other plans. It started when our presbytery elder stopped me in the aisle one Sunday morning and said, have you ever thought of becoming a reader? No, nope, was my reply, and I carried on thinking, what a strange question. God didn't give up. I thought I would like to find out more about my faith and ask my minister if there were any courses I could do. That week, he received a flyer for the Scottish Church's Open College. I enrolled for a course. I thought it sounded really interesting. And when I met the others doing the course, they were all training to be readers, but not me. I was doing this to inform my children's ministry. I work with children, not adults. In the meantime, my mum had introduced me to a speaking group for ladies. I went along with her as a visitor and thought it was great. I joined, loved it, and learned how to speak before an audience of adults. The final shout God gave me was our, was our session clerk passing me and handing me a flyer saying, you might be interested in this. The flyer was for the inquirer's course, the first step anyone had to take before carrying out a ministry within the church, be that as minister, deacon or reader. I still, still, I still didn't immediately take the step out of the comfort of my boat, children's ministry. The fear set in. I felt totally inadequate, lacking in knowledge. But as the title of Ortberg's book says, if you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. Jesus said to Peter, come. The call. Peter heard Jesus call and in obedience stepped out of the boat. Remember the sea was stormy. He wasn't risk taking for its own sake. He took that step in extreme obedience before he got out of the boat. He said, if it is you, command me. We need to discern God's call and what might be a foolish impulse on our own part. So taking some time to be sure is important. When entering any ministry in the Church of Scotland, you have six months of reflecting on your call, working alongside an appointed person. Whilst Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on the water. It was when he looked around and took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. God promises to be with us all the time. With fear and in trepidation, but with God's promise, I eventually stepped out of the boat and went on the inquirer's course. As you're well aware, my final decision was to say yes to God. The journey wasn't all plain sailing. There were choppy and stormy times when I questioned whether I was doing the right thing. But I am glad that I persevered and with God's help completed my training. Final step that Ort Bird noted was a changed life. My life has changed, I as a person have changed, and my faith has grown. I too realise this might not be the end of this journey, as our church is in change. None of us can sit back in our boats and be boat potatoes. We all need to ask ourselves what our boat is, our comfort zone. We need to listen for God's call and discern whether it is his call or just our own idea. The call to discipleship may come in stormy times or in quiet times, we have to keep our ears tuned to hear him. And yes, we will have fear of our own inadequacy, but have faith in God's promises. I will always be with you, he said. 
then we need to step out of the boat in faith and follow his command. The result? Our lives will be changed. We will get to know God better through Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And others will be changed because of the change in us. So if you want to walk on water, you need to get out of the boat. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one true God, now and evermore. Amen. Let us take this time to give our offerings to God. Lord, receive our offerings for the growth of your kingdom. Amen. Let us come once again before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, show us how to have trust. Lead us to know the full conviction of our faith that whatever strife or storms we find ourselves in, you will come to us. Extend your hand and invite us to take hold of it. Show us how to believe. Reveal the full breadth of your glory that we might lift the limits on what we are prepared to do and are able to. Envisage us the possibilities of life and creation under the energy of your Holy Spirit. Show us how to live. Teach us through the stories of the Bible and the example of others that we might understand the way of discipleship and apply it in the way we set about living our own lives. Compassionate God, Many in our world live with fear and many find it difficult to do anything other than cower away from the world as if beaten by the pressures, challenges, anxieties and the worries of day-to-day -to -day existence. We pray today for those drowning in the sorrow of their grief and the emptiness of their loneliness, for those drowning in squalor, poverty and hunger, for those drowning in the inadequate availability of basic resources, for those drowning in a sea of violence and hatred as victims and as, and as those embroiled in it. And for those drowning in a notion of despair as they see no way out and no prospect of change in their life's circumstances. Especially in these uncertain times as the world battles to contain COVID-19. Lord, we reach out with all our concerns into your hands. God, your love for people is no illusion. It is no trick of clever rhetoric. It is no mere opiate created by the church to ease people's pain. Your love is real. It is living and it is present. Through your church, may this love be known in the world and made available through us to all we come across. May people come to believe in the constancy of your love by the words and actions of our own faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
witnesses to something amazing, something unbelievable. Jesus walked on water. Witnesses to something frightening, someone's failure. Peter fell in. But Jesus reaches out to help his friend and the water's calmed. Let us go now to find ways of doing the same. Reach out and give someone a hand up this week. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon us, those we love and those we struggle to love, now and evermore. Amen. Thank you.